holotype process was first introduced by Henry Fox Talbot in 1841. This process involved taking an image on a camera, better known as a negative, and transforming it into a full-size image after the plates are removed from the camera. This process allowed for the shortest amount of exposure time than any other previous technologies. It took photographers around one to three minutes to capture a photo. The calotype negatives had the light and dark tones reversed in the negative. Most people chose to use the negative as their image, but they could have taken the process one step farther. They could have taken the negative and created a salted paper print, but these images were known to be unsharp, small, and brown. They also began to fade around the edges, which is why most photographers chose to stick to the negative images. The introduction of this technology made the process of taking photos both easier and faster. It allowed the photojournalist to take multiple pictures in a shorter amount of time because the exposure time was reduced from one hour to just three minutes. Another process that helped to change and improve photojournalism was the collodine process, which was introduced in 1851. This process, like the calotype process, was used to create a negative image. The transparency of the glass used in this process allowed for high resolution in both highlights and shadows. This process was most used from 1855 to 1881. The exposure time in this method continued to decrease from the last. The exposure time now ranged from a few seconds to a few minutes, depending on the amount of light that was available to the photojournalist. After exposure, these negatives required darkness. The photojournalist had to bring dark tents or cards with them, along with all the chemicals necessary to produce their images. These negatives were then brought back to their home labs to create images called albumin prints. This process allowed for photo photographers to create negatives in the field. Once they brought the negative back to their home labs, they could, co could be copied multiple times. Overall, this process decreased the amount of time it was necessary to stand still because, again, the exposure time was even less. The only con to this method is that the photographer needed to bring a lot more equipment with them into the field, eliminating the ease of movement and virtually eliminating their ability to follow the action. The next important process in the improvement of photojournalism was the dry plate process, also known as the gelatinum process. This process was inv invented by Dr. Richard L. Maddox in 1871. In this process, the solution was put onto plates before the photojournalists took them out into the field. This allowed for easy transportation, and the plate could be prepared earlier than it was going to be used, increasing efficiency. The only downfall to this process is that it did not decrease the exposure time. All in all, this process was a great addition to the technologies available to photojournalists. It allowed for the prep work to be done before they set foot into the field. The exposure time was longer, but it required less equipment to be carried around. These images also did not have to be developed as soon as the photojournalists got back to the darkroom or lab. They could be developed at the user's leisure. The introduction of the Leica camera in 1925 was not important because of the use of its film. It was important because it was the first camera to make 35mm film truly viable. After its introduction, this camera became the most popular film format for photographers. It was developed by Oscar Barnack of the Lights Company and decreased the shutter speed or exposure time to just fractions of a second. This technology allowed for photojournalists to have an easier time shooting on film. The camera was much smaller than anything they had seen before, allowing it to be more portable. The decreased exposure time and increase in portability, this camera allowed for photojournalists to follow action and to get the best possible photos that they could have. The Kodachrome was first introduced in 1935 as 16mm movie film. This process was expensive, and because of this, not just anyone had access to the use of this film. The dye in this process is not added until a developmental process has started, and the film itself starts out as black and white. There are three emulsions in this process, each sensitive to a different primary color, then coated together on a single film. This film became the industry standard for over four decades, and it peaked in the 60s and 70s. The dye in these photos will eventually fade, but if stored correctly, it would hold up to, for up to 100 years. This technology allowed photojournalists to capture stunning color prints easily and effectively within 35mm film, which they had not had the opportunity to do before this point. The point-and-shoot camera introduced in 1991 started out as strictly a film technology, but the technology is still used today in some of the digital cameras on the market. The exposure and the focus for the image is done completely by the camera itself. These cameras were also smaller than any other camera on the market at this time. They were lightweight and they did not require the user to carry around bags or accessories. All they needed was the camera. This technology again made photojournalists' jobs easier and faster because they did not have to spend time focusing the camera or finding the right light because the camera did it for them. The photojournalists also did not have to carry around as much equipment, but keeping their mobility up allowing for them to follow the actions of the scenes better. In 1991, a technology was introduced that many photographers still use today. 
The DSLR camera is a digital camera that uses a mirror mechanism to capture the picture. The user needed to carry around a digital storage unit that provided both battery power and storage for the camera. The main unit had the ability to store 156 photos, but you could install other pieces to the camera that increased this number to 600. When first introduced, this camera could run a photojournalist close to $30,000, which was pricey for a lot of users, but they did gain access to digital photos instead of film. This technology gave photojournalists the opportunity to upload images onto their computers. It eliminated the need for dark rooms and the use of chemicals altogether. Improvements continued to be made upon the DSLR camera until the current day technology was released. The DSLR cameras that we currently use today have all of the same components and functions as the old DSLR camera, but with an added bonus. These current cameras are equipped with Wi-Fi, eliminating the need for photojournalists to be in the office in order to upload pictures. As long as the user had access to a Wi-Fi connection, they have the ability to upload and submit photos. The quality of the photo that is uploaded may not be comparable to that of the image stored on the camera, but the photojournalist has the opportunity to pull the image off the camera at a later date. This allows our photojournalists to spend more time in the field while still hitting the mark on all of their deadlines. They can show their editors or bosses what images they have so they know whether or not they are on the right track towards what is needed. Ultimately, this allows photojournalists to get their news out quicker and more efficiently. The last piece of technology that we all spend a lot of time on today is not specific to photography or even photojournalism, but it has everything to do with improving the quality and speed at which we as viewers receive information. The introduction of the internet has allowed for photojournalism to move fully digital in the last two decades. Some, if not all, magazines and newspapers have ceased paper production and moved strictly online. This allows for photojournalists to upload and publish their works in many different ways and on many different platforms. Photojournalists have the option to instantaneously upload their photos from the second they capture it. It has revolutionized the way, they photo the f the way photographs are distributed and viewed, and I think it will continue to make an impact on the way that we, as viewers and as photojournalists, have the opportunity to display their images.